May it please the court. I will discuss the, the first of the two issues, which is actually the second issue in the briefs. And, and I'll, I'll explain why I think that should be discussed first in a few minutes. But, okay. um, and that is whether the uniform final judgment of foreclosure, which is the first final judgment, whether that's a final judgment for purposes of the guarantee and the doctrines of the law of the case and collateral estoppel. Appellee, in getting the trial court to enter the second judgment, second final judgment against appellant, which is a final judgment that is the subject of this appeal, argued to the, to the lower court that the uniform final judgment of foreclosure, the first final judgment, was raised judicata as to the amounts due from the obligors with an S, meaning both the primary obligor and the guarantor, which is the appellant, Mr. Christopher Scott. And that's in paragraph nine of the motion for summary judgment. It's a record is 665, is where that starts. In the same document, the appellee argued that summary judgment was appropriate under the loan documents with an S. Mr. Mitchell, let me interrupt you. Notwithstanding appellant's argument, what judicial labor remained to be done as to that first final judgment? I would say that it, it would depend on the foreclosure sale and if the foreclosure sale. Um, but is that not a ministerial act that was set out in the final judgment, the date was set, the procedure is by statute. So what judicial labor was outstanding? I would say none, and that's why it, it, it's appellant's position that that was a final judgment. It said in there that the court reserves jurisdiction to enter deficiency judgments with an S, which would mean against the primary or obligor as well as Mr. Scott, and that should have been the end of the case. There was no, no more judicial labor. Ex but it was not appealed. And it was not appealed. And, that's, and, and in fact, Mr. Scott is happy with that. Mr. Scott is not appealing the first one. He's not asking for a bite at the apple on the first one. He only takes issue with the second final judgment being in. But the first final judgment fixed the numerical amount. And Mr. Scott doesn't have a problem with that because at the foreclosure sale, he believes that it would have um, um, sold for in excess for the amount, and therefore he wouldn't have owed anything. It was only after they got the second final judgment and started wanting to go after his assets. That's what he takes issue with. He believes there is no, no more judicial labor. It should have ended with the uniform final judgment of foreclosure that determined that the rights that Appelli had, Appelli's prede predecessor in interest actually, was to um, get a deficiency judgment against the, the primary obligor and Mr. Scott after a sale. And that was it. And the court, I know that Appelli argues that that if you look at the guarantee, it allowed them to do this and allow them to go after Mr. Scott, but that's really not what the issue is, what's in the guarantee. The fact is, is that it was adjudicated that these are the rights, it's a uniform final judgment, it reserved only to enter deficiency judgments, not to go after Mr. Scott directly, for which let execution issue. And so he's fine with that. He's only appealed the second judgment, and that's all that, that um, um, he takes, and that's why that's the first issue because first and foremost, it's his position that the second final judgment should not have been entered. If the court disagrees and finds that it should have been entered, then he takes issue with the, the way that the court determined the amounts. Well, but under the, it, he had a continuing guarantee of payment, correct? Mm -hmm. And it was unconditional, is it correct? Um, well, it was, I, I believe if you looked behind the final judgment and looked at it, I, I think that would, that's what you would see. I see. believe they're unconditional, which really yeah. means that the lender could have skipped the whole foreclosure process and gone straight after him. Certainly could have. So, so but instead they didn't do that. They went, they foreclosed on the property first, and then they proceeded against him in, a, in anticipation of a, de a deficiency is what it looks like to me. Right, they, they, they could have. They could have just sued Mr. Scott um, Appellant by himself. They, that's what if we look behind at the document, they could have done that. Um, but again, they just didn't do that. And so our, it's our position that that is a final judgment that adjudicated the rights of the Bank of Tampa, who is Appellee's predecessor in interest, and Mr. Scott. And if but was that not your opportunity to contest the amounts that were due? Well, if, if we had, he doesn't have a problem with that final judgment because he believes the property will bring enough to where he's not gonna owe a penny. It's okay, so he is abandoning his argument that there were material disputed issues of fact as to the amounts due because he now agrees the amounts were set by the first judgment. It, it, that's why I argued this the second issue first because 
his first and foremost, that second final judgment should not have been entered, which means if the court agrees with that, then, then that's it. If the court disagrees and the appellee was allowed to get a second bite at the apple and go back and get a different final judgment that allowed for different rights against Mr. Scott, not just to sell the property after the foreclosure, or not just for a deficiency judgment after the sale, but actually to go straight for his assets. If the court finds that that was proper, then, then that final judgment is based on, because that's, that's what they argued to the lower court, was that, okay, it's already been determined as to the amount of principal, the amount of interest, the amount of late fees. And the court, the court agrees that it was okay for, for the lower court to do that second final judgment, then I think he's got the right to argue as to the amounts. In other words, it, it was either final, the first one was either final, meaning that was it, or if it wasn't final, then he has the right to, to, to appeal how, how the trial court got to that second final judgment. That would be, that would be the argument. Did I answer your question? Um, and I think if the court looks at the, and, and, and I think what Appley is arguing now is that the Uniform Final Judgment of Foreclosure didn't have anything to do, and I think it's on page 10, with the guarantee. And what they argued to the lower court was that, okay, there was still this issue regarding Mr. Scott regarding liability, but that was adjudicated. There is a summary judgment of foreclosure dated May 16, 2013, which, which says that Mr. Scott defaulted and the primary obligor, which is 1901 West Platte Street LLC defaulted, and that's at the record at 284 to 286. So that was determined. Then there was the hearing which results in a uniform final judgment of foreclosure that says the court reserves jurisdiction to enter deficiency judgments. And we believe that that was, was a final judgment from the four quarters. Um, and again, I think Apelli's arguing that, that there had been no adjudication regarding Mr. Scott whatsoever up until then they proceeded and got the second final judgment. We think the record is, is, shows otherwise. Um, the issue is, is the court disagrees with with what I've flipped around and made the first argument that it was okay for the second final judgment to be entered, then we would, I think the, first, the preliminary issue there is whether or not a transcript is required to, um, to appeal a summary judgment hearing. And based on the, I think it's the last key, the Brown decision of this court, 766, Southern Second, 1076, we, it's our position that it's clear that the summary judgment, the hearing, the transcript of the hearing on the summary judgment motion is not required. I know that Appley filed a notice of supplemental authority citing a case, it's Jellet v. City Mortgage out of the third district. And, and it seems to say otherwise, but Jellet didn't overrule two cases that I've cited. It's Seal Products versus Bank National Trust Company, 705 Southern 2nd, 973, and Ramiro v. All Claims Insurance Repairs, 698 Southern 2nd, 605. Um, and where the third district was real clear, they said that the summary judgment hearing consists of the legal argument of counsel, not the taking of evidence, and consequently, it's not necessary to procure the transcript. I, if necessary, I think I could reconcile those cases, those three cases from the third district with Lasky, and say that if a party is making a creative argument on appeal before this court, it might be necessary even in this court and even considering last week to show that you made that creative argument. But when you're simply pointing to rule 1.510 in the record and you're saying that the court considered an affidavit, even though the affidavit referred to business records and a payment history that wasn't attached and rule 1.510E says that's improper. When a, when a party's on appeal and asking the court to just look at this rule, look at the record, I, I don't think that, that a um, transcript is necessary because it's not that creative of, of an argument. Um, and in fact, I think it's the obligation of the court to make sure that's right when pursuant to the plain language of Rule 1.510E. But to the extent that we were required to bring that to the court's attention, the affidavit of Mr. Thomas Ortiz, that's at um, the record at 209 paragraph 8, his affidavit actually refers to the affidavit of the Bank of Tampa's Representative Ms. Melissa Berman, and he points out that no payment history was attached. Um, we also think it's clear that it was discussed at the hearing because after the hearing, the Bank of Tampa filed the payment history, which shows that we were discussing that, and they tried to correct it after the fact. 
which isn't allowed under Rule 1.510, and that's at um, that record there is 270 to 274, where the payment history was filed after the hearing. And finally, even if appellants required to make the specific argument to the court and, sh and have a transcript and show this court that that argument was made, even if the court ruled against us on that, we still think that the summary judgment should not have been entered, and that's because Bank of Tampa did nothing more than say in an affidavit that this amount is owed in principal, this amount is owed in interest, and this amount is owed in late fees with no supporting documentation. What Mr. Scott did was he said, I don't owe this amount, this amount of principal. I don't owe this amount of late fees. I don't owe this amount in interest. And what happens, and this is something that seems to happen a lot, is that the lower court will, will somehow require more of a defendant than what was required of the plaintiff. In other words, the plaintiff can just say this amount is owed without any supporting documents. But if the defendant is says that- Is that the same hearing that we don't have a transcript? Signed? Yes, yes. That, that's, and I'm just talking kind of in, in general because the argument is actually- There should have been more proof. Yeah, yeah, meaning that- How do we know the parties didn't waive the additional proof that might have been required if there's no transcript? Well, because the court still has to look at the summary judgment record um, to see if, it, if, it's, if it's sufficient. You know, I mean, I mean it's, not, it's not for the purpose of, of, of taking evidence or testimony at summary judgment hearing. It's based on the affidavits and what was filed at least 20 days before the hearing. And there's no waiver argument. In fact, what Apelli argues is, is that the defendant's affidavit was legally insufficient because, quote, it contains no factual allegations sufficient to refute any of the evidence established in the record. I so mean, they do argue the lack of a transcript is uh, fatal to the appellate review. They, right. they do make that argument. Oh, yeah, yes, and I would say that based on Lasky, which again, 766, 1076, the court pointed out, this court pointed out that neither party chose to provide this court with a transcript of the hearing on the motion for summary judgment. The court ruled that a transcript wasn't necessary. The lower court had granted summary judgment on several counts, and this court reversed on some but not all of the counts, even though there was no transcript. You're coming up to your 15 minutes. Okay. You can keep going if you want. Okay, I'll just, I can wrap it up right here. What I'm saying about the evidence is that when the plaintiff just says this amount, the movement says this amount's owed, I think it's proper for the non-movement to say that amount's not owed. If the Bank of Tampa had said um, the, the um, parties made 110 payments and attached all these details and set forth, I think the defendant would have been required to say, no, you didn't account for this payment. We made 111 payments and we made 112 payments. But that wasn't done, so we think it's proper for Mr. Scott to just say the exact opposite of what the Bank of Tampa had said. Thank you. Proceed. May it please the court, John Landcammer for Pelley Pauscher, Inc. Uh, the only issues presented on appeal are whether there is a remaining material issue of fact as to the amount of principal interest or late fees due at the time of the October 2nd, 2014 final judgment on the guarantee. And whether the trial court can <coughs> enter excusable, or an executable judgment on the guarantee based on issues of race, judicata, and elections of remedy. Since 2012, this case has traveled under the same complaint. Three counts, the first for foreclosure of a mortgage, the second for guarantee, and the third for a uh, breach of the promissory note. The uniform final judgment of foreclosure dated April 8, 2014, determined the result with respect to the foreclosure action. It was a uniform final judgment of foreclosure, the same one that set up by the 13, in the records of the 13th Judicial Circuit and that has been proposed by the Supreme Court of the state. The appellee admits that the for uniform foreclosure judgment dated April 8, 2014 constitutes res judicata as to the facts adjudicated therein. The amount due was a fact that was determined in April of 2014. The unconditional guarantee the damages under that unconditional guarantee are the same as the amount due from the borrower, which was, in fact, determined by that judgment. That judgment became res judicata, collateral estoppel, um, and the law of the case in this matter. Moving forward, the 
appellant filed a motion for rehearing. They knew that their, this guarantor knew that his rights were affected by that final judgment. He filed his motion for rehearing, which was denied. And the guarantor participated in the foreclosure proceedings, correct? Absolutely, Your Honor. So he knew that this, this was effective on him. He filed the motion for rehearing. It was denied. No appeal was taken of that April 8, 2014 order, which locked in those amounts. It is inappropriate for them to come back now and say, well, we should be able to re-argue the amounts due because they are, in fact, res judicata. After the adjudication of the foreclosure judgment, the guarantee count lived on as a separate independent claim. As noted by this court in Florida Lifestyles Realty, Inc. in Goodwin, 917 Southern 2nd, 1060, uh, a final order may issue with respect to a single count of a multi-count complaint if that count constitutes a separate and distinct cause of action, not interdependent with the pled claims. Florida law clearly permits litigants to simultaneously seek an equitable judgment of foreclosure and a legal judgment against the borrower as well as guarantors because such actions are not inconsistent remedies. That's citing this court's opinion in Hammond versus Kingsley Asset Management LLC from 2014, which cites Royal Palm Corp Center Association versus PNC Bank, a fourth DCA opinion from 2012 that acknowledges that Florida jurisprudence has adopted the traditional common rule, identifying claims at law and equity as independent remedies. In other words, a final judgment on one count is not, makes a final judgment, not a partial judgment as to other accounts because they're independent remedies. A guarantee claim is tantamount to a breach of contract claims pursuant to this court's opinion in Ferguson Enterprises versus Astro Air Conditioning and Heating. That's a 2014 opinion. Therefore, you have to prove that there was A, a enforceable contract, B, a breach of that contract, and C, damages. What's being argued by the appellee is that one element of those three elements was determined at the time of the April 8, 2014 judgment. The damages, the amount that was due. The determination of the existence of a guarantee as well as the breach of that guarantee were not determined in a final order, a final order as opposed to the May 2013 judgment, which was a non-final order as it did not end judicial labor as to any issue, until a final order of, against the summary judgment on the guarantee dated October 2nd, 2014, which is the only order that sh which is before this court on appeal. The adjudication of principal interest and fees in the uniform final judgment of foreclosure dated April 8th, as I stated before, became the law of the case in res judicata. That's under this court's opinion in Ronton versus Washpool, Inc., 456 Southern 2nd, 967, which provides that the law of the case doctrine precludes litigation of all issues necessarily ruled upon by the court, as well as all issues upon which the appeal could have been taken, but which were not appealed. In this case, the damages issue in the foreclosure judgment, the amount due, was an issue that was necessary to the determination of the foreclosure. Therefore, that issue is the law of the case with respect to all other portions of the case, including the amount due under the damages provision in the guarantee. I did not initially find, but uh, the appellant found a case from the third DCA, Uterbeck versus Starkey, which extends the res judicata principle into um, orders within the same case, as long as there is a final order that precedes them. So any final order within a case is final determination and res judicata as to subsequent orders. Um, after the for foreclosure sale was prevented by the borrower's bankruptcy, that is when the case went forward on what we've discussed or what I've proffered to this court was a existing guarantee claim that was not disturbed by the entry of the foreclosure judgment. 
Historically, a creditor on a promissory note secured by a mortgage could pursue its legal and equitable rights simultaneously as the pursuit of one was without satisfaction was not the bar to the other. And this court made that clear in the Gottschammer versus August case. Um, in that case, the guarantee judgment entered first. So there was a guarantee judgment in place, a final guarantee judgment. That judgment was entered first because the borrower in the middle of the case, as opposed to post-judgment, had filed bankruptcy. After the bankruptcy was resolved, the lender came back to the court and asked for a judgment of foreclosure. The court determined that it was appropriate, even though there was a final judgment as to the guarantee, to enter into a subsequent final judgment as to foreclosure. Gottshammer cites to Klondike Inc. versus Blair, which is a fourth DCA opinion. In Klondike, the party seeking the foreclosure judgment did not request the relief for over a year after the entry of judgment on the note. So there was a passage of a year. The idea is if I can't get paid under the foreclosure judgment, then I get to move on to the legal rights. Which, which really is just an option on behalf of your client because your client could skip the foreclosure judgment altogether and move forward full force to be fully satisfied on the guarantee, correct? Yes, well initially there was a foreclosure judgment. There was a bankruptcy that precluded a sale which my client then decided to go forward under its rights on the guarantee. I understand. It, yeah, I understand. The um, defendant identifies the fact that the uniform final judgment of foreclosure states deficiency judgments with plural as opposed to judgment and draws the inference that the use of plural versus a singular indicated that the trial court meant for that order to be to determine the rights against the guarantor. That, that's just not correct because the uniform judgment itself, the form, provides for deficiency judgments. So no inference could be drawn from a form that everybody that uses. Are you saying it's a typographical error or it's not an error at all? It's not an error at all. It was, it's the form. The form says deficiency judgments. Practitioners in the area of foreclosure are asked to use the form, uniform final judgment of foreclosure. And the clarification wasn't sought to find out one way or the other what the court meant. No, Your Honor. Well, I mean, it's kind of obvious, but you're obviously not going to be able to collect twice. Absolutely, Your Honor, and that's my exact next point. Under Han this court's opinion in Hammond versus Kingsley Asset Management, the court, this court's identified the PNC um, case out of the fourth DCA and said, well, the PNC judgment from 2012 said, we can, a, a judgment creditor can enter simultaneously a judgment on the note, saying that the note balance is due, as well as simultaneously a judgment on the mortgage foreclosure. Moving forward, the Hammond versus Kingsley Asset Management case said, that's true. However, there cannot be a risk of double collection. So you can't have double collection. In this case, and that, that was an expansion of rights to say you could do it simultaneously as opposed to separately. You go under one remedy, and if you can't collect under that remedy, come back. The PNC and the Hammond determinations say, no, in fact, you can do it once. It's convenient. You only have one final judgment. It can be appealed. You don't have a successive interplay with the trial court and the appellate court. You have one bite at the apple. And you're also going to have to dispose of the collateral and the foreclosure matter in a commercially reasonable manner. You can't just fire sale it as well and then seek to get the difference on the guarantee, correct? Absolutely, Your Honor. That was a very clear in the Hammond decision. If the party that gets the foreclosure judgment goes out and sets it for sale and has a sale, they can't do anything with respect to the note claim until they come back to the court and ask the court to apply the difference between the value of the property and the amount attained at sale to that guarantee judgment or the note judgment, however the case may be, and then the note judgment would then be collectible for the balance. 
very similarly to a deficiency balance. You're getting down to your five or six minute mark. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, the, I, I just want to point out a few points that were made by the um, appellant. First off, the outstanding reservation of a deficiency is not affecting, does not affect a, the finality of a judgment. There's the Provident National Bank case versus Thunderbird Associates, 364 Southern 2nd, 790. This was first brought up in the reply brief, but in that case, it was clear that there was a final foreclosure judgment and subsequently a final deficiency judgment. The reason is because of the, when there's a mortgage foreclosure, there is a merger of the, mor of the mortgage into the mor foreclosure judgment. So when you come back for a deficiency, you're actually coming back based on the judgment. And you can't have a deficiency until there is a sale of the property. So that, that argument doesn't really make sense. Um, the arguments, I, I don't think it's necessary to argue whether the record demonstrates an error of the trial court um, with respect to there being a transcript in the record because all of that stuff was res judicata in the April 8, 2014 judgment. However, there was some issues made with respect to the Latchkey versus Brown opinion. That was very different facts than this case. In that case, the court noted that it was a very complex case and that there were eight different uh, bases for motion for final judgment, summary judgment, and no one ground was dispositive of the entire case. With respect to the claim that the third DCA's case, Seal Products versus Mansfield, was in somehow um, dispositive or overturned the Zarate opinion from the third DCA, uh, I'd first like to point out that the Zarate opinion postdates the seal products case. And I think that they're distinguishable in the fact that it's true that if you have a summary judgment case and you just line up the records and there's no objections to any particular evidentiary issue, and you, you can look at them without a transcript. It's true. You've got a motion. You've got a response. You've got the affidavits in support and in opposition, and whatever deposition records, et cetera, are in the record. Where one party is trying to object to a certain por portion of the record under 1.51e or otherwise, that needs to be specifically stated on the record. And it would normally be found in an objection filed prior to the hearing or at the hearing in the transcript. In this case, there's neither an objection to the affidavit and the uh, history of payments in any writing or a transcript of same at the hearing. If there was, you know, I, there, there is not. Um, finally, with respect to the Jellick case, which I filed um, as supplemental authority, that specifically speaks to the Rule 1.51 zero E issue. It comes out of the third DCA, but it does say that with respect to rule 1.51 E, the objection has to be made or it's waived. In this case, it was never made. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Mr. Meacham, you've got your five minutes left. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, just the uniform final judgment of foreclosure, it's either raised judicata for all purposes, or it isn't. It's our position that it is, that there is no more judicial labor, that that was just an, an administerial act of selling the property, and let that me, should have been the end of the case. Let me ask you a question. If that, just out of my own curiosity, if that argument is correct, then why didn't the court reference all three counts, or two counts, however many counts that were in there, other than the mortgage foreclosure count and the uniform final judgment? Well, I, I guess I guess that's, that is what the issue is, is if there's a four-count complaint. And what wasn't in the judgment? Right, right, saying. right. You're saying raised judicata, but the trial judge is sitting there and thinking, I'm only deciding this one issue. 
And if it was more than that one issue, then I would have gone for a rehearing and said, Judge, you want to throw in count two is gone. Right. right. Well, I guess, I guess so the question is, is if there's a, if, let's say, it's a, just to make it a little simpler in my mind, is if there's a four count complaint for intentional interference with the contract, fraud, and what have you, and then there ends up being a final judgment that's entered that doesn't reserve jurisdiction on counts, I would say that that's the final judgment. In other words, well, well, so, so you, you think it should have reserved jurisdiction on counts as opposed to reserving jurisdiction on the items disposed of in that particular count. It's almost like a separate lawsuit. They could have brought a separate lawsuit. Right. They didn't have to combine it, but they say filing fees, I'm assuming, is right. one of the reasons. Right. And so, so I would say that, that without the reservation of jurisdiction on account two or anything, when you've got a final judgment that doesn't reserve on specific count, they've been dealt with. And if the party who is unhappy with that okay. doesn't appeal it, that, so it would be my So you think that's a legal requirement that must be in that final judgment, as opposed to it just on transcribed hearing, the party say, hey, we've got these other counts, let's just leave them over here for now, we'll come back and do that, and the judge doesn't put anything in writing. How would we know that didn't happen? Well, well I would say that, that I know that, that it has to be real clear for there to even be a right to appeal it. Sometimes a final judgment will <laughs> say it's a final judgment, but the, this court or the clerk will look at it and say it's really not because it says specifically in there right. that the court reserves jurisdiction for these other counts. So when it is just a final judgment on its face without looking, I think for appellate purposes, it's the final judgment. And, it, and if it doesn't reserve jurisdiction on account two or something else, then, um, okay. you know, and so that would be my argument. There's no dispute that, that Bank of Tampa could have done this differently, but they filed, they sued Mr. Scott and the primary obligor at the same time. They got summary judgment that says they're both in default. Then they got a final judgment that didn't reserve jurisdiction on, on account. Um, and, and 